Um, I just wanted to disagree <laughs> about the question of, I hope this isn't like too esoteric, but the question of nationalism and uh, maybe give a little bit more of a anarchisty sort of left Marxist perspective, or maybe you don't need to label it. But, um, and I don't think other people here necessarily disagree with this, but um, you know, when I look at the movements, state movements uh, from the left even, whether it's the Bolsheviks or the uh, Evo Morales or, or Hugo Chavez, um, I still see a class divide in those states, and I still see miners being oppressed, uh, people going on strikes, and getting ripped off and exploited um, now in the name of socialism or something. You know? And so I just wanted to put that out there, that I, I'm not really down for a, a state solution, and I think that uh, a lot of what the Wobblies did was they were, would, were willing to look beyond you know, borders and nations, and they would organize anyone, Chinese people, Mexican immigrants coming in, um, uh, and it, it didn't matter to them. So people would say they're taking our jobs, and they'd say, well, let's organize them too. Let's organize everybody. And so it's this idea of internationalism, not in the way <laughs> Richard Pearl or you know, Obama would use it, but uh, of a solidarity across all nations. And so um, just wanted to throw that in there. Who wants to say something next? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just, I think I want to agree by disagree or something like that. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, uh, the anarchist movement actually, uh, if it can be called a movement, a, a, a herd of cats can be called a movement. Um, and, uh, uh, I, I, I'm in it. I'm a member, so uh, I, I, I know whereof I speak. Uh, uh, could really actually learn a lot and does learn a lot. Uh, you know, I've, I've witnessed this learning from indigenous struggles and indigenous conceptions of sovereignty that are not necessarily nation-based yeah. in the sense of a state. I agree. And, and uh, uh, that conversation needs to happen more and more. Uh, and uh, I actually, I was talking uh, with Professor Ortiz this morning um, about uh, uh, Lalani and I were, and a couple of other people were interviewed on an anarchist radio show uh, by uh, uh, Kailani Kalamui. Uh, I don't know if you can look at, Look up her show, it's on uh, Wesleyan's radio station. Uh, but anyway, uh, Kailani asked me, so how do you reconcile anarchism with the Hawaiian nationalist struggle? And I stumbled around and said, well, I, I don't. I'm actually kind of a pragmatist on the matter, is that uh, I, I'm working with people who are fighting for getting the US out of North America and uh, out of, uh, out of Hawaii, uh, but that uh, the, the situation after that, uh, I hadn't really thought about that much. And, and Laulani actually came in uh, and talked about a, a, a Hawaiian version of sovereignty uh, that doesn't really depend on a, a nation state uh, for its legitimacy or for being put into action. And it's actually something that we as communities and people working together, not alone, it's not an individualist thing, uh, can um, affect without waiting for the state or without waiting for capitalism to fall or without, we can do it right now actually. Uh, and, and by kind of claiming our sovereignty to, to do what's, what's best and what's, uh, what's right. So uh, I think there's a, a lot more I can learn about anarchism from indigenous notions of sovereignty that aren't based on, on the nation, and so I'd like to hear more about that. Um, I think the operative word, really, that we need to all embrace is self-determination and not uh, get bogged down with the state or anarchism or uh, communism or socialism, but self-determination, that uh, people's 
um, decide who they're going to be and how they're going to be. And if they want to stay, I support that. Um, so I think telling um, people who you know what they should do and should not do is correct or not is is exactly what colonialists do. What is the civilized thing to do? It's just a new version of it. It's like you should do this and you should do that. And all these things are processes. What's taking place in Bolivia and the Andes is a um, long, long process of uh, a movement towards socialism, indigenous socialism. The, the constitution there is the most amazing. Um, people um, written by consensus over a two-year period of time. So we, I think as, you know, as U.S. Americans, uh, we have to really be cautious about judging and saying people should do this and people should do that because that's what the U.S. always does to everyone. So for indigenous peoples, I think the, simply to support the right to self-determination, get behind those struggles and not try to tell people what they should do or not. Um, I'm not sure Sure, I agree. I don't think that we can have, that everybody can have self-determination. I think that would result in a sort of chaos around the world that would be absolutely unstable. Well, we do have a chaos now, but I think that would be the, I mean, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think I think you have to look at it in a case by case, case basis. I, I think that could be really, uh, you know, it could be, it could be really insane. Um, if we, you know, everybody, everywhere wants to suddenly opt out then uh, uh, of, of a nation state. I think uh, one, one, of, one of the things I'm thinking about also is that I think as never before, our democratic rights as citizens are really uh, at risk at this point in this country. Not only the NSA, the surveillance, the technologies they have, the cameras, the, uh, the ability to monitor millions and millions of messages, emails, Twitter, everything. And if we can talk about building socialism, okay, then that's fine, we build social democracy, whatever we're talking about, but we also need to be really vigilant at this point in history uh, about protecting our democratic rights and what's left of them, because there are very powerful forces that would like to take that away from us, you know, and, uh, uh, and the security establishment, and using the whole notion of uh, security and, and, and the agents to us to really attack, whether it's indigenous movements or democratic or movements for social justice. So I, I think that's something that we, we need to be conscious of. I mean, they have weapons now, and I don't mean to sound paranoid, but they have, they really have weapons to destroy our privacy and destroy any kind of uh, ability for us to, to communicate. And we, we need to be aware of that. We need to fight back as much as possible. That's that's all I wanted to say. Let's, let's be, let's pay attention to what these, uh, these people would like to do. And without being paranoid, but just be just understanding there are forces out there that would be really be interested in instituting some, some degree of repression. Just because you're not paranoid doesn't mean you're not bothered. <laughs> uh, I'm going to turn the mic over uh, to an, an, a comment, but I wanted to make one of my own briefly. Um, as uh, an indigenous woman, and also uh, I was talking to Roxanne a little bit earlier today that um, I, I have a lot of experiences in uh, northern New Mexico and southern Colorado and here, and, and listening to uh, dialogue. Um, and I mean, you hear, honor your kupuna, honor your ancestors, and I believe that's true, uh, that that's an important thing to do. But then I also think of my father, who was in the meat packing union, and my father was also in the steel workers union. He was also in the governmental workers' union, and my grandfather, who was in the unions. And that is part of me honoring my kupuna, honoring my ancestors, and honoring uh, the fact that, that, you know, all their hard work that they, that they did um, has resulted in me you not know, working 80 hours a week, although I still do that anyway. But, uh, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and turn that. <laughs> Say that I, I think the, we have a living wage in San Francisco, and that struggle was very unifying uh, in terms of all sectors of, of people because everyone is affected by low wages. So I, I think that is a unifying demand. I just wanted to ask uh, you mentioned fighting back against the 
invasion of privacy. And I don't really know what to do. I, I avoided Facebook so far. Uh, I try not to sign up for anything. And it's too late. I got Google as me. Um, I'm just wondering what else, what, what fight back, how? <laughs> um, if I can give a little bit of a, of, of a shot at that, um, I think that a lot of people here know me. If you didn't know me before, you probably know me from Facebook. <laughs> and so, you know, obviously I've kind of bought that one. Um, people have a, have a very reason, have very much have a reason to be afraid because there's a lot going on. And I think there are people who are in this room right now who could probably tell you about um, some really interesting surveillance that's been happening lately involving um, lasers and drones yeah, that, that have been um, working in Honolulu. And uh, yeah, you want to say something about it? I guess there are, there are um, two flights of uh, one drone um, two times in the last four days. I believe over Thomas Square, maybe five days. And they had the, the green light arc. Green light um, uh, went, uh, kind of spiraled over um, the art academy and over the housing around the art academy and then uh, kind of made the loop. Um, the scanner was able to pick up an extremely wide range, like scan your whole body, everything. So, yeah. Now, this is officially this is a, a lidar um, laser, which is supposed to be not harmful, and it's it's the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers doing, um, you know, basically high uh, high resolution mapping. That's all great and everything. Of course, the question is, what else is going on, right? And, and what what do we have to worry about when all of this is going on? You know, we already know that the you know a cell phone is a communication device, but you know it can also be used as a tracking device. Sure, Facebook. You know, there I am posting the revolution up on Facebook. You know, and um, every. You know those things. Those things are reality. But just as protesters have come out in order to fight anything, you know, people who've stood up for anything, their rights as workers, um, the protection of sacred places that they love, whatever the case may be, in order to do so, we need to get through the fear. And we need to stand up and say, hey, if you're going to come and track me, this is, here's, here's what I'm doing, and here's why. You know, because there's a world out there that needs to see it, needs to hear it. And if there's a government that's also seeing and hearing it, I, I, my feeling is there's a, there's a point at which we need to say, OK, that may be happening. They may be powerful. They may have the guns. But we're going to do it anyway, because that is the only way. That is the only way, by us standing together and standing up for one another, that we are going to win. Uh, well, we're going to have uh, Ray Catania speak, and then Turn it over to Roxanne, and then actually, it's it'll be 9 p.m. So I'm going to give it to. I want to encourage everybody to come tomorrow. Um, I'm going to be talking about the GMO issue on Kauai and the big match we had about uh, 4,000 people that came out, um, and how and how we got uh, unions involved, you know, uh, to get a working class perspective, because uh, some of the vegans, the young tendency to. When we talk about organic, yeah, 
you know, and they don't like talk about working class issues, you know, and we gotta fight to go beyond that, you know. And uh, that is uh, kind of an irritant to me because some of these guys feel that um, the struggle began only when they came here 10, 15 years ago, yeah? And they deny the history of our uh, brothers and sisters who fought huge labor battles against the capitalists. Now, the brother, um, you brought up some very good stuff, um, and I think what you're saying is key. Um, I think the major issue for the working class, where the working class people are going to move, is around wages and pay. And um, I'm really into that too, yeah? And, but at the same time, I, I take up these other issues because I want to make sure that we get a working class perspective in these issues. But um, like I know at home, my wife, she don't give a crap about the anti-GMO issue or that I got arrested in Wailua. All she worried about is her damn paycheck. Yeah? And she worked two jobs. And my daughters, they work, you know, um, what do you call it? They work two jobs each too. You know, in uh, retail and restaurant and stuff like that, they're working hard. So they're not really concerned about daddy's issues out. You know, daddy, ah, shut up about the class struggle. What about my paycheck? You know what I mean? I try to draw the correlation, but they don't like listen. But the thing is that working class people will move around these kinds of things, and we gotta be uh, cognizant about that too. And I know, like, um, uh, like uh, local five does that. You know, and uh, they'll shut down a street. You know to make sure the workers get representation. In fact, um, they um, are organizing workers with a, uh, a class perspective, understanding the nature of capitalism, you know, and they're doing a real good job about that. All the other unions are way behind. Uh, I'm with uh, the uh, very, very moderate Hawaii Government Employees Association. I'm probably, probably the only blue collar guy in a white collar union. <laughs> And um, those guys are so goddamn conservative, but yet, that's my union, yeah? And I gotta fight with them too, because I get on pension, and I get on medical for life, because of the HGA. And the reason why is because we got chapter 89. Chapter 89 guarantees that all public workers are gonna be represented by public worker unions. And the capitalists are gonna to wanna to get rid of that pretty soon, so that's gonna be an important fight. But I, I, I do understand what you're saying, brother, about wages and pay and stuff, because I think we gotta move on that kind of stuff as well. At the same time, I think we gotta let working class people understand too that we live in Hawaii, you know? That the ocean and the land is very damn important to us. I'm a fisherman, you know? I grow things in my yard. I eat kalamungai and paria and all that kind of stuff. That's what I'm into, you know? And so the land and the water and the ocean and the mountains are very, very important to us guys, yeah? So we cannot forget that, you know? We cannot just say um, uh, pay, working conditions, and union stuff. We gotta, we gotta bring them all together because what we wanna do is that we wanna create a new world. We wanna create a world where we don't have exploitation and where we understand and live with the environment in a beautiful way. They sound like a bunch of crap to a lot of you guys, but that's what I believe. Yeah, it's working. Well, I, I just have a very short thing to say about the um, uh, security system and, and uh, paranoia. Um, I guess being maybe the oldest person here, I went through an era of uh, surveillance that didn't depend on drones or any of the technology today, and I can't see that it's any worse now uh, than COINTELPRO was in the 1960s and 70s, and I, I was certainly a, one of the one of the victims of it, and the organization I was with, the American Indian Movement, was uh, crushed by it, destroyed by it, the Black Panther Party, the Young Lords, the um, probably uh, the militants in the labor movement, we haven't even researched that yet, the women's movement. Uh, so it, it does, put, but what destroyed us was not COINTELPRO, it was our paranoia. Because we bought the, the kinds of things that provocateurs and informers uh, worked among us. And we have to build a level of trust among ourselves so that we don't believe some stray uh, rumor 
about someone. Um, and this, we had, that's how I think, you know, I do think we have to fight it, but we have to fight it in ourselves. We can't really change that technology as it is. We couldn't change coin. In fact, we didn't even know about COINTELPRO until it was After. way into the <laughs> 1970s. You know, we, we, then we knew what we had experienced. But as we were experiencing it, Black Panthers killed each other. American Indian Movement people killed each other. Young Lords killed each other. Drugs were brought in. Um, so this is what we have to do is learn from that, read about it, go through your archives, watch the film called Telpro 101, and it applies now. You know, whatever the method is, it goes back to the 19th century, uh, to, to the Bolsheviks, you know, to, it's nothing new. The state is going to try to stop revolution. We should accept that. And, and then build our movements of trust, and mutuality and strength, and that is the best antidote to um, to this kind of surveillance. We're running out of time, but I want to be sure to ask you about something that I think listeners might wonder about: how to reconcile, or if there's any tension between sort of the direct democratic practices in an occupy or deoccupy situation with negotiating an actual sovereignty movement that is making a sovereignty claim and, and a national claim when so many of the anarchist principles are sort of at odds in some ways with at least state-centered nationalist projects. And I wonder about how that's played itself out or how you all think about that. Well, I think, you know, the, the Occupy movement and its anarchist principles, it's actually anarchist protocols and it asks the question, do you really need an ideology, a single ideology, to be able to mount a resistance um, to, to the system? And the answer, I think, might be no, you don't need it. You can use anarchist uh, protocols and principles that encompass and, and bring together a lot of different ideologies. And I think that might be one of the innovations of the Occupy movement itself. Being hardcore on the ideology hasn't really worked here because everything has to be flexible partly because we're small and partly because there's so many different things to respond to. So one of the things is rather than saying, well, anarchists don't believe in the state and therefore there should be no sovereignty, period, we can sort of deal with this by saying, well, in a perfect world there would be no state, but in Hawaii the people that have sovereignty are native Hawaiians, not the United States of America. So if we're going to work piecemeal and practically, that's what side we need to be on rather than being all or nothing about it. So, so there's a lot of flexibility, I think, built into how anarchism gets practiced on the ground, like this horizontal work uh, has to be done with tons of negotiation. It's time consuming, it's frustrating, uh, but it's actually quite worthwhile. The, the ideologies kind of haven't really been the issue here. So no, but there are people that do think the sovereignty movement is wrong and get right up in their face and say that because they, but they're not an, an Occupy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've been in the Hawaiian movement for a really long time and I've worked with a lot of sovereignty organizations, but my, myself, I'm from a maka'ainana or a commoner background. You know, my family are fishermen and farmers and, you know, those maka'ainana, those common folks, you know, who work the land and things like that practice a kind of anarchy naturally. You know, they talk to each other, they work things out. There's really no need for any kind of a top-down structure. And in a lot of sense, um, a lot of, you know, what we think of state sovereignty really is a more recent introduction and honestly Occupy might be a really good reminder to us that it may be time to move beyond that towards something that is a manifestation of our ea, our internal sovereignty that exists inside of us, between us, between us and the aina, between us and the kupuna and the future generations and all of those things that are really, really connected to us on a deep spiritual level. Mm -hmm. And all that predates any kingdom. Right, exactly. 
you know, if we think about it, the idea of a Hawaiian nation is only 200 years old. And yet our sovereignty is very, very old. And so for us to be able to practice that sovereignty collectively, you know, all of us to be able to practice that sovereignty with respect to the ancient people and with respect to the future generations whose future we have to look out for, you know, we may need to look right now at what kind of a world we want to build from the aina up. Mm-hmm. The aina being the land. Mm-hmm. Right. Right on. So any closing thoughts? Well, my closing thought is I've been around a long time. I'm coming up on 60 years old. I beginning activism in the late 60s. The difference between then and now, the population is double now of the world than it was. And we're much more connected and much more hooked up. So I'm, I have some hope. I want to see what's gonna, what that's going to bring. Right on. <laughs> Yes.